Let's go back to that not disturbing scene of Rhaenyra going into labor. If you slow it down right here, you can see a few frames of her dragon Cyrax screaming. This just further emphasizes how much the rider's feelings can affect their dragon. Aemond has been clearly holding on to a lot of resentment towards Lucerys, so he wanted to taunt him and scare him and possibly take an eye, but he didn't want to kill him. Aemond would have been a lot better off if he was given the same advice that Viserys gave to Rhaenyra at the beginning of the series, when he said this. The idea we control the dragons is an illusion. Eamon's situation is proving that the riders are in less control than previously thought. Before leaving Storm's End, Lucerys even tells Arax to listen and obey him, something the dragon just straight up doesn't do, but we're gonna talk more about that in a second. After the overwhelming and viral success of my breakdown and analysis of House of the Dragon Episode 1, I'm back. So go ahead, warn your families, cause I'm about to give you my full in-depth analysis on basically the entire Entire season in order to better help you understand that ending. Let's begin by going back to the beginning. King Viserys was constantly cut by the Iron Throne. He couldn't hunt. He could barely deliver a killing blow. He couldn't handle being on a boat. He ignored pressing matters regarding war. He was just in this constant state of decay. His spirit animal is a 119 year old tortoise laying on its back stuck in the hot sun. But even after all of that, I would say that he wasn't really fit to be king. However, the one thing that did make him somewhat fit to be king was his determination. Viserys fully understood the severity of the information that was passed on to him, starting with the story of Daenys the Dreamer seeing the end of Valeria in, you guessed it, a dream. Something that would come true 12 years after the initial dream. Oh yeah, Valeria, or Old Valeria, is the ancestral home of House Targaryen, House Celtigar, and of course, House Valarian. Valeria is as dead as my hopes and dreams. It's kind of like their version of Rome, except way cooler because at least theirs had dragons as it was ruled by dragon lords. This puppy prospered for over 5,000 years before it was destroyed, but why was it destroyed? Well, Daenys convinced her father Aenar to leave Valeria and move their house to what we now know as Dragonstone. Then, the doom happened. The most common and rational explanation for the doom would be the fact that Valeria resided on the 14 Flames, which is a volcano mountain chain across the Valyrian Peninsula, and that one day, those volcanoes erupted and blew everything up. Up. When Daemon tells Rhaenyra that dreams didn't make them kings, dragons did. He's not wrong. Dragons ended up making the Targaryens the kings. But he is wrong about the dream stuff, because a dream depicting the fall of Valeria is the sole reason their house still exists. The fall of Valeria basically sent everyone into chaos and bloodshed for like a century, which was appropriately named the Century of Blood. But that was until Aegon the Conqueror entered the chat, and then conquered everything, and then united the seven kings kingdoms. Reggio even talks briefly about this during his speech at Pentos. To Aegon the Conqueror, you exalted forebear. You joined our cause against Volantis in a century of blood. Anyway, Valeria went downhill real quick, so when Aegon saw in his dream that the end of the world was coming, he made sure to pass that info down to his children, specifically the heir to the Iron Throne, doing this to ensure that he's preventing the end of the world, because in Aegon's dream, he saw the darkness approaching from the winds of winter gusting in from the distant north, threatening to destroy the world of the living, but he also saw that his heir was going to be the one person that's able to unite Westeros against the cold and the dark. The dream that Daenys experienced came true 12 years after initially seeing it. Aegon's vision wouldn't come to fruition for a few hundred years, but Aegon was prepared, and he had his song printed on a dagger, the same dagger that Viserys carries with him at all times. Some of the words on it read, from my blood come the prince that was promised, and his will be the song of ice and fire. This explains why Viserys was so determined to have a son. Not just because of the good old patriarchy, but to potentially spawn the prince that was promised. Which adds a lot more reasoning as to why he made the choice of choosing his newborn son over his wife Emma. And why he was so reluctant to put Rhaenyra on the Iron Throne. Viserys understood that when winter comes, all of Westeros must stand against it. And that in order for that to happen, a Targaryen must be seated on the Iron Throne. Viserys didn't really desire the Iron Throne, but he he knew that Aegon's dream was bigger than himself, his own desires, and the senseless political drama surrounding him. Come to think of it, Viserys is a real one, except honestly, no, he kind of 
fucked up, but we're gonna get to that in a second. During his last few breaths, Viserys thought he was talking to Rhaenyra, telling her more about Aegon's dream, but in reality, he was talking to Alicent and speaking all about Aegon's dream to her. But Alicent was never the heir to the throne, so she was not given the burden of this knowledge, specifically about the Song of Ice and Fire. So when Viserys incoherently talks about Aegon and the prince that was promised, Alicent thinks it's her Aegon, and not Aegon the Conqueror. So when Aegon is in the carriage ride with Alicent, and he's saying that his father Viserys never loved him, and etc., he was quite perceptive because he was saying the truth. It's implied that Alicent's Aegon is a piece of garbage, as he bets on unethical fights involving children, and helped produce a bunch of other kids around the city with random women. But speaking of people who are unfit for the throne, let's go back to Viserys for a second. We're not done with you. It's said that the white deer is a symbol of divine royalty, and that the rare sighting of one is considered a good omen. Not seeing the white deer creates doubt in Viserys's mind, of whether or not he made the right decision of making Rhaenyra the heir to the Iron Throne. Because Viserys's unwavering belief in Aegon's dream leads him to easily believe in these things like omens, signs, superstitions, etc. However, unknown to Viserys, Rhaenyra did see the white stag, which according to everyone else, that means she's fit for the throne. So during this hunting trip in episode 3, second of his name, Rhaenyra attacks this boar. During this moment, she is clearly letting out a bunch of frustration from her dad making her marry someone and fall into the same kind of role that her mother went through. I thought it was an interesting parallel how Viserys was barely able to strike down the brown deer, and yet Rhaenyra over here is operating with rage, strength, and dare I say, fire, just overall massacring the animal. By the end of the episode, Rhaenyra and Daemon are covered in blood, Rhaenyra finishing off the boar, and Daemon slaying Prince Strayhar, making him king of the Narrow Sea. In this episode, both of them prove themselves worthy of a reputation opposite of everyone's preconceived opinions of them. Kind of like the moment where Alicent strikes Rhaenyra, revealing to everyone a whole different side of herself. A side that even Otto thought he wouldn't see. Rhaenyra even tells Alicent, Exhausting, wasn't it? Hiding beneath the cloak of your own righteousness. But now they see. But going back to Damon and Rhaenyra proving themselves, in the episodes following their covered in blood moments, both Rhaenyra and Damon retreat from that mindset, almost as if they regress back into their more passive roles. Damon leaves politics behind and tries to settle in a place like Pentos with his wife Lena. Rhaenyra falls back into a more traditional role like her mother by having a bunch of babies with her husband. Definitely her husband, and not a member of the Watch like Sir Harwin. Okay, it's Sir Harwin. But those lives are taken from them when it's made known that Sir Harwin is the father of Rhaenyra's children, and Lena has complications with her pregnancy. Lena decides to Jakaris herself after being in a similar situation to the one that Emma went through, and Harwin is killed by a fire started by Laris. These events are what, in a sense, drag Rhaenyra and Daemon back into the political world, leading to the night where Aemond obtains Lena's dragon and loses an eye for it. Then Alicent turns it into a figurative and literal eye for an eye situation. At the beginning of the series, Viserys reminds Corlys that as king it is my obligation to avoid war until such time it is unavoidable. So Viserys being really passive in this scene and not wanting to take an eye out of his grandchild goes back to his approach to keeping peace in the kingdom and applying it within his family. It's kind of poetic that when Alicent tries to take justice into her own hands, she ends up cutting Rhaenyra with Aegon's dagger, during the moment that truly divided their family, using the one thing that stands for why they should be united. Some years down the road when the kids are grown up, Rhaenyra and Daemon return to King's Landing after their hiatus, and they are greeted with some unexpected changes. The first biggest change would be how the Targaryen murals have been covered up, as the Green Council ended up replacing Targaryen heraldry with emblems of the Seven. Like right here, you can see a giant seven-pointed star hanging in the main hall, turning the place into something more like a monastery. Here's the shot of it in episode one, and here's what it looks like in episode eight. Pretty freaking dour, right? The main reason for these changes would be Alicent turning to religion to find redemption after her disagreement with Rhaenyra, also explaining why she had everyone pray before dinner. Alicent is holding close to the religion of the seven gods, something that Targaryens are just not known to do. Which is why I thought it was interesting that Jaceris and Lucerys swore that they wouldn't start a war under the eyes of the seven. Viserys kind of f 
fucked up, as he did put his own desires before the fate of the realm and the world of the living. When choosing a wife, he chose Alicent over uniting the two most powerful houses in the realm. Marrying Lena would have been a secure way to prevent war and less internal opposition to the Iron Throne, but Viserys didn't, he married Alicent, and this put Otto Hightower in a very advantageous position, especially when Viserys was on his deathbed. When Alicent's father was stripped of his title and sent away from King's Landing, it was done because Alicent stood by the word of the king and her princess. But then she realized that Rhaenyra lied about sleeping with another man outside of marriage. Alicent, holding all this animosity towards Rhaenyra is what made her change into this green wardrobe. Because as Laris reminds everyone, the Beacon of Hightower glows green when it calls its banners to war, starting the division of those dressed in black and those dressed in green. This resentment towards Rhaenyra built up over time, which is most likely why Otto could easily persuade Alicent to go through with this trial of proving that Rhaenyra has illegitimate sons, prevent those children from ever taking the Iron Throne. But the more that we chilled in King's Landing, it seemed that Alicent was more innocent than expected. She was following the advice of the maesters, keeping Viserys on Milk of the Poppy. She tells Damon and Rhaenyra that if they could see him without it, he's almost blind with suffering. And then later in the episode, we see the amount of pain that the king is in after spending the entire day without his medication. Speaking of the more noble people in the show, Vaemon told the truth better than anyone in the show so far, but his forthright nature has stunted his political growth in the past. Vaemon is not willing to pull an auto when it comes to playing these games, and needless to say, his emotions got the best of him. When Vaemon makes the accusation that Rhaenyra's children are not legitimate, he's letting out all this aggression that he's been holding on to for around 16 years. So when things don't go well for him and his house, he straight up went for it. It looks like he got ahead of himself there. I guess you'll never be head of the Seven Kingdoms now. I didn't see that heading in a bad der Will Johnson, who plays Vaiman, went on to say that when the petition goes completely sideways for him, he knows he's gonna fall on his sword. But I want to fall on my sword my way. And my way is to tell the absolute truth. So even if nothing is done about it, everybody in this room will know. But the king definitely knew that the kids weren't Valarian because of the everything about them, and it seems like the only person who wasn't in the know was Lucerus. So I will say it's pretty incredible that after so many things like not seeing the white deer, and Rhaenyra straight up telling him that naming her heir is what divided the realm, the king still chose to stand by his daughter's side. When Viserys shows up to dinner, he's wearing a gold mask, kind of like the one that Prince Drehar wore that's currently hanging up in the castle at Driftmark. And if you think I'm not gonna go on a quick rant about Prince Drehar, then you are sadly leaf mistaken. Prince Drehar, over here, is also known as the Darth Maul of House of the Dragon, as he is an insanely cool-looking villain who doesn't really talk and gets killed off way too soon. He wears this cool-looking mask because he has grayscale, and the grayscale is now spread to his face. Grayscale being a fatal disease that turns your flesh rigid and dead, basically turning your flesh into stone. Drehar obtained this mask from a shipwreck, and it's the same kind of mask that is worn by the Sons of Harpy, but you'll see them down the road. Drehar was given given the nickname Crab Feeder, mostly because he would nail his enemies to posts during low tide and then have them get eaten by live crabs. Drehard led the Triarchy's armies and fleets to conquer the Stepstones and free it from pirates. For some time, the Lords of Westeros were okay with paying tolls for safe passage through the Stepstones, but then one day, Drehard drove up the price of the tolls to an outrageous amount. Corliss Valorian's house was most affected by the price hike, so Corliss eventually partnered with Prince Damon and his dragon to eventually slay Drehar in the year 108 AC. But you already knew the last part. Anyway, going back to when Viserys shows up wearing that gold mask. Practically speaking, this mask is used to cover up his deteriorating face. And I also know that gold is supposed to be a representation of royalty, but it's also possible that this is a reference to the future Viserys. You know, the same guy who got melted gold poured on his head. During the dinner with basically the entire family, not Rhaenys, but basically the entire family, it's interesting how the gold-plated side of Viserys' face was on the side of Alicent, and his non-covered face was on the side of Rhaenyra. So to me, this was more symbolic of the division of their family. During that dinner, it was really the first time that we see Viserys tell everyone what he really wanted from them, that the crown will not stand strong if the House of the Dragon remains divided. Alicent and Rhaenyra always had a deep connection with one another, but their real friendship was constantly torn apart by politics and the patriarchy. But then we see Viserys go from this passive ruler who refuses to intervene 
intervene to someone willing to directly speak to them and lay down the law, explaining that if they can't keep peace for the crown, then do it for their father, grandfather, and husband. Something about this speech was able to positively affect Rhaenyra and Alicent. The toasts that they both make to each other seem genuine, and show us that they could resolve this decade-long feud. But they managed to let their kids develop a new one. In a sense, King Viserys got lucky. He was escorted out of the room with a raging headache before things went very far south between his children and his grandchildren, as they started fighting immediately after he left. So in his mind, the state of his family is as cool as a cucumber. I felt like Viserys' death was really long and intimate, making me feel really uncomfortable and sad. Needless to say, I watched it over and over again. When Viserys says no more and then the screen cuts to black, we hear his last two words, which are, my love. After a few rewatches, in this moment, I believe that he's referring to Emma, almost like he's finally being reunited in the afterlife with the woman he truly loved. Aemon getting the dragon is what completely transformed his character, but even after Aemon glowed up, got a dragon, and could probably win a fight against any of them, his cousins are still taunting him with the pig. At first, I was like, Daemon is pretty similar to Aemon, and then I realized that Aemon is an anagram of Daemon, as it contains the same letters of Daemon that are just rearranged. Alicent has been put in a pretty similar situation as Viserys the Peaceful, because he was someone that looked at being in a position of power as too much of a burden, as he was almost too human to be king. But he had the obligation of following tradition to appease his family. The same exact thing is happening with Alicent. I know the same thing is happening with Rhaenyra, but we're gonna get to that in a second. Alicent is following the same kind of peaceful approach to leadership as the king. We see her genuinely grieving over her husband's death alone, with no one watching her, so she's not putting on a performance. Alicent was also caught off guard when Otto's small council had been secretly plotting on what to do when the king died, specifically overthrowing Rhaenyra and putting Aegon as king. Alicent had been wanting to make Aegon king for a while now, and even misinterpreted the will of her husband to solidify that he should be king. But she didn't want to put Aegon on the throne if it's going against, you know, order or ethics or ending in the death of Rhaenyra and Daemon and their entire family, or, you know, starting a war in Westeros. Dude, Otto is such a snake. One thing I loved is that when they were praying, you can see that Daemon and Otto were just having none of it. When Aegon wrongfully accepts his position as king, Rhaenys just opens up the ground with her dragon. She had the entire family in her sights, but wasn't gonna kill Aegon because of her moral standpoint. In the words of the showrunner Ryan Condal, she, as in Rhaenys, knows that if she she sets fire to that dais, she ends any possibility of war, and probably sets peace throughout the realm. But I think she probably doesn't want to be responsible for doing that to another mother. Even though, like, statistically speaking, she probably just killed like 20-something plus mothers by plowing through the center of the room. But it's okay, I guess, because Rhaenys is able to flee the city and get word to Dragonstone that Otto is just pulling some shady stuff. Also, for anyone wondering why Rhaenyra, Daemon, and the rest of the fam didn't stay when Viserys is on his deathbed, Rhaenyra just wanted to get her family out of King's Landing because of the rising tensions between the two families, and Rhaenyra did tell Alicent that she would return on Dragonback after getting the kids back to Dragonstone. I definitely empathize with anyone asking that question. It would have been really smart to stay in King's Landing just in case Viserys died, which he ended up doing, because you know, Rhaenyra could better secure her succession that way. But going back to Rhaenys causing the definition of a scene, I love how earlier in the episode, Helena says this. There is a beast beneath the boots. With basically no context. And then little did we know that she was going to end up predicting where the beast was coming from at the end of the episode. Helena is reminiscent of Cassandra from Greek mythology. Cassandra was the daughter of King Priam and Queen Hecuba of Troy. She was given the gift of prophecy, but was also given the curse of no one believing her prophecies. I bet you can tell where this is going. So Cassandra foresaw the fall of Troy, but no one believed her. Helena is most likely going to keep saying prophetic stuff throughout the series, specifically stuff that is predicting everyone's downfall, but no one's gonna listen to her. So it's gonna be real interesting to pay attention to what she's saying. After naming Rhaenyra as his heir, Viserys shows us that he's reluctant about getting a new wife in order to start producing heirs to replace Rhaenyra. Earlier in the season, Rhaenyra claims that her father has only ever wanted a boy for as long as she can remember. When Alicent tells Rhaenyra that her father loves her and that he chose her for his heir, Rhaenyra replies with this. He didn't choose me, he spurned Daemon. Claiming that the only reason she was heir is because her father had to reject Daemon. But Daemon, who was heir at one point, 
point, was never told about the Song of Ice and Fire, meaning that Viserys truly placed all of his faith in Rhaenyra. By the way, the music that was playing during Rhaenyra's coronation was absolutely Fantastic. Rhaenyra has way more dragons than the Greens, but she doesn't have enough houses, so she sends out her sons to secure some of them. Lucerys is given the task of delivering a message from the Queen to Boris Baratheon at Storm's End, but after getting rejected by Boris and receiving a surprise visit from Aemond, Lucerys pieces out, but is chased and eventually swallowed by Vagar. I think Damon spoke a little bit too soon when he said that he would rather feed his sons to dragons than have his sons carry shields and cups for Aegon. Let's go back to that not disturbing scene of Rhaenyra going into labor. If you slow it down right here, you can see a few frames of her dragon Cyrax screaming. This just further emphasizes how much the rider's feelings can affect their dragon, something that Aemond was not well aware of. Because you know, Aemond has been clearly holding on to a lot of resentment towards Lucerys, so he wanted to taunt him and scare him and possibly take an eye, but he didn't want to kill him, mostly because he didn't want to start a war. I mean, I guess Alicent kind of got what she initially asked asked for, truly getting an eye for an eye, giving Aemon the title Kinslayer, which is not as cool as Kingslayer, but it's, you know, a thing. Aemon's situation is proving that the riders are in less control than previously thought. Before leaving Storm's End, Lucerys even tells Arax to listen and obey him, something the dragon just straight up doesn't do. Aemon and Lucerys lost control of their dragons, as both dragons completely ignored the commands of the riders and continued to attack each other. If you add this situation on top of the scene where Vagar is not wanting to set Lena on fire and refusing to burn her, it does solidify that they don't have full control over their dragons. Now looking back, it's almost as if Vagar killed Lena, not out of obedience, but more out of mercy. Aemon would have been a lot better off if he was given the same advice that Viserys gave to Rhaenyra at the beginning of the series, when he said this. The idea we control the dragons is an illusion. And that they're a power man should have never trifled with. It seems that after finishing the season, Viserys is a lot wiser than I gave him credit for. In the book Fire and Blood, it's really easy to assume that Aemon chased after Lucerys with the full intent of killing him. But in House of the Dragon, he does it by accident, and feels the weight of his mistake after doing it. Unlike the book version, who's just operating with no remorse. I really like that they took the show in that direction, because I feel like this scene really adds a lot more depth to his character. Regardless, Aemon not being able to control his dragon is going to be a very interesting development in Season 2, during the Dance of the Dragons, also known as the Civil War between House Targaryen and House Targaryen. Speaking of which, I feel like the orange glow of the fire is obviously in a lot of scenes because thematically it makes sense for a show that follows dragon riders known as Targaryens. But in the most crucial scenes, the fire is very present in the frame, representing the rising tensions between the two families that will inevitably lead lead to the Dance of the Dragons. So I'd love that in order to better help signify this, here's the ending shot of the first episode, and here's the ending shot of the season finale. Rhaenyra went from cupbearer to this. Wine, my queen. Rhaenyra finally took her father's place, even if it is during a civil war and she doesn't currently have access to the Iron Throne. When Viserys' death and Aegon's succession is announced, Daemon immediately starts planning for war, while Rhaenyra is coming from a more level-headed and peaceful approach just like her father, not wanting to burn down the entire realm and preventing war for as long as she possibly can. But at the end of the finale, Daemon delivers the news to Rhaenyra that her son has been killed. And for anyone still wondering where they're going to be taking season 2, and if Rhaenyra Nira is still going to maintain that peaceful approach to her leadership. I'm just gonna quote the book Fire and Blood, specifically the line, then the storm broke and the dragons danced. After watching the season, I was like, wow, that was definitely the succession of Game of Thrones and I love it. And if you actually made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching.